Hello everyone. In this lab, we're going to discuss volcanoes and hotspots. The three main goals are one, to understand how and why volcanoes form, the different volcanic settings under which they form, and uh, their link to plate tectonics. Number two is to understand the concept of hotspot volcanism and how we can use it as a tool to determine plate motion through time. Um, and as a case study, we'll look at the Hawaiian Emperor Seamount chain. Uh, number three is to learn how calderas form, the main controls that determine how much elevation is lost during an eruption um, and why some volcanoes are more explosive than others. Um, and as a case study in your quiz, uh, we'll look at Mount St. Helens and Krakatoa. So there are four main types of uh, tectonic settings of volcanic activity. Um, I'm going to play a short video here in a minute that uh, has animation showing each of these four main tectonic settings um, that I think does a really good job of showing exactly what's going on. Um, I understand that some of you have already completed the plate tectonics uh, lab, while other, others of you will complete it after this lab. Um, if you've already completed the plate tectonics lab, as you watch this video, just keep in mind uh, the different uh, plate boundaries that you learned about and some of the uh, volcan volcanic activity associated with each of them. If you have yet to complete the plate tectonics lab, um, keep as you go through the plate tectonics lab, keep in mind what you learn uh, during this video. in this animation at how uh, the movements of the Earth's plates controls volcanic activity on the Earth. Let's look first at what's called continental rift volcanism. Now, in places where forces are causing the Earth's plates to stretch, especially in the continents, a couple of different things can happen. In this part of the animation, you can see there's what's called a rift valley, where the crust is ripped apart and it sinks down to form a valley. That's kind of like the East African Rift Valley or much of the western United States of in Nevada is, uh, is like this. Or you can simply get cracks in the crust that will allow magma from the mantle to rise up. In either of these situations, what we call continental rifting, we get uh, volcanoes to form because as the plates separate, it allows the mantle to rise upward. Really what happens is the separation of the plates depressurizes the mantle underneath. There's not as much weight on top and that actually that reduction in pressure allows the hot rock of the mantle <clears throat> to actually melt. Now, more important even than that is the kind of volcanic activity that happens is associated with subduction. In this animation, we're going to subduct some ocean floor underneath the edge of a continent. And as that happens, as you know, you get an ocean trench, but at a certain depth, about 80 miles down in the earth, the subduction of the plate triggers the melting of the mantle and that magma rises and a whole series of volcanoes begins to pop up along the edge of the continent parallel to the trench. We call this a continental volcanic arc. Uh, the Andes Mountains are a classic example of such a, such a system. Now another thing we can do is have, instead of ocean floor subducting underneath the continent, we could have ocean floor subducting under other ocean floor. In this case, the animation has flipped around, but it doesn't really matter. You can imagine either, either of these in a mirror image. Same process. We're going to subduct the ocean floor underneath this other ocean floor. We're going to generate magma. The magma is going to rise, and a whole series of volcanic islands is going to pop up in the ocean parallel to the trench. You see how it's very similar to the continental situation. The only difference is that the volcanoes are popping up out of the ocean parallel to the trench instead of on land parallel to the trench. Okay? So uh, an example of this would be the, uh, the Aleutian Islands, say, or the Philippines, or the Marianas Islands in the Pacific. These are all what we call volcanic island arcs, volcanic island arcs. Now, the other main source of volcanic activity on Earth are what we call hotspots. Hotspots, in, in a situation like this, there's magma being generated all along a long line. Hotspots are situations where magma forms in just one local area. And, and we think these hotspots form because of large blobs or, or columns of magma that rise from deep in the mantle. We call these mantle plumes, mantle plumes. 
And as, man, and as, as tectonic plates move across mantle plumes, if mantle plumes stay in one place, and there's controversy about whether they do, but let's assume the plume stays in one place. It'll make a volcano. The volcano will get carried away. Another volcano will form. It'll get carried away on the moving plate. And yet another volcano will form, and it'll get carried away. And you get a chain of hotspot volcanic islands. This is the classic uh, example of how, for example, the Hawaiian Islands formed, uh, all in one, all in all in a line, one after the other, as they moved um, across a hotspot. Let's back this up again, and we'll show one volcano, then another, and then another, forming over the hotspot. So the, those are the main reasons uh, and processes by which the Earth makes volcanic activity. Okay, so your quiz is going to focus predominantly on uh, hotspot volcanism. Um, this is because hotspot volcanism um, is a an awesome tool for determining plate motion um, and the like the 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 rate of plate motion and direction um, as a function of time. Um, before we had uh, GPS um, and other tools for measuring uh, plate motion. Um, this, this was our, this is really our only tool to determine how quickly uh, the plates are moving. Um, if you've already completed the plate tectonics lab, you know that the plates on Earth are in fact not stationary. Um, and if you haven't done the plate tectonics lab yet, um, you'll learn that in this lab. So just to reiterate um, what was said in that short video is volcanic hotspots um, form from mantle plumes that remain mostly stationary over long periods of time. Plates do not. Um, thus, uh, volcanic, vol uh, thus, you'll form chains of volcanoes as the plate moves over this stationary hotspot. Uh, two notable hotspot chains um, that I'm sure you're all, you've all heard of, uh, you just may not have known that they were associated with hotspot volcanism um, is Yellowstone um, and then the Hawaiian Emperor Seamount chain. Uh, so the Yellowstone caldera chain, um, we'll take a closer look at um, in this lecture video and how we can use it to determine uh, plate rate um, changes throughout time. And in your quiz, you'll do the same thing only with the Hawaiian Emperor uh, Seamount chain. So uh, this figure is um, of the Yellowstone caldera chain. Um, so the current hotspot is located um, sort of on the border of Wyoming, um, Idaho, and Montana. So this hotspot has remained stationary over long periods of time. Uh, the plate has not. So if we want to figure out what direction the plate is moving, we can look at where the current hotspot is, or where the hotspot is located. Um, and how we find that is we look for the youngest feature. Um, so this is the Yellowstone, the current Yellowstone caldera. Um, and so this is the youngest feature. And that means that um, it was created relatively um, recently. Uh, so it must be over directly over the hotspot or close to the hotspot. Um, whereas the oldest feature is the McDermott caldera. Um, in this figure. And so that was created 17.3 million years ago. Um, and it was formed from the same hotspot. So that means when it formed, it would have been located where um, the Yellowstone caldera is. And so it's had to have moved um, to get to its current location. So just to animate this, 17.3 um, million years ago, the McDermott caldera uh, was located where the Yellowstone caldera is. Um, and then the plate moved 
and um, a new caldera was formed over the hotspot. Um, and this continues over millions of years um, until present day, where now the Yellowstone uh, caldera is located over the current hotspot. So um, this tells us that uh, this plate had to have moved, uh, sorry, had to have moved um, southwest for um, the McDermott caldera to get from the hotspot to its current location. Furthermore, um, we can, since we know the ages of these calderas, which we can, um, yeah, since we know the ages of these calderas um, and we can measure the distance uh, between them and the current hotspot, we can actually quantify how rapidly uh, the plate was moving between the formation of um, two calderas in this case. So on average, how fast was the plate moving between the formation of the McDermott caldera and the Bruno Jarbidge caldera? Um, so between 17.3 and 12.5 million years ago um, in centimeters per year. So in short, um, the rate of plate motion is measured as distance divided by um, the time in which that distance was covered, which I'm calling delta T here. So delta T, the time between the formation of these two calderas was 4.8 million years. Um, and the distance between these two, so the distance the plate had to have traveled in that amount of time is 250 kilometers. Um, just some unit conversions that you'll need for the quiz um, is that one kilometer is 10 to the five centimeters or 100,000 centimeters. Um, and 1 million years equal to 10 to the 6 years or 1 million years. Um, so the distance traveled is equal to 250 kilometers, um, which is equal to uh, 25 million centimeters. Similarly, the change in time is 4.8 million years, um, which again is equal to uh, 4.8 times 1 million years. Uh, putting this all together, we have distance, so uh, the 25 million centimeters divided by the 4.8 million years, um, which gives us 5.2 centimeters per year. So on average, uh, the plate was moving 5.2 centimeters per year um, between the formation of these two calderas. Um, similarly, and I'm not going to step through the math in as much detail um, here. Uh, if you're struggling with the math, you should try to prove this example to yourself. Um, but now let's take a look uh, between the formation of the Bruno Jarbidge caldera and the Yellowstone caldera. So between 12.5 million years ago and the present. So now our delta T is 12.5 million years um, and the distance uh, between these two calderas is 475 kilometers. Um, so taking 475 kilometers, converting it into centimeters, and then dividing that by uh, 12.5 million years gives us 3.8 centimeters per year. Um, so has the North American plate speed increased or decreased as a function of time? So uh, we calculated the average rate of plate motion between 17.3 million years and 12.5 million years to be 5.2 centimeters per year. Uh, more recently, uh, between 12.5 million years ago and the present, the plate has been moving on average 3.8 centimeters per year. So that means um, that the plate of the North, or sorry, the uh, speed of the North American plate has actually decreased um, as a function of time. Okay, so the second topic that uh, you'll be quizzed on is um, our calderas. So I just introduced you to the Yellowstone caldera change, or chain, sorry. Um, but what exactly is a caldera? Um, a caldera is the 
collapsed magma chamber of an erupted volcano. So, you know, we've been talking about volcanoes, but what happens um, when these volcanoes erupt? Um, some don't really erupt, they just sort of ooze um, lava, like the Hawaiian volcanoes, but other volcanoes like Mount St. Helens and Krakatoa actually, um, you know, they'll uh, erupt catastrophically. So while the Hawaiian volcanoes volcano is um, basically erupting continuously, um, so other volcanoes will sort of build up over long periods of time. They'll build up significant pressures and then they'll erupt in one go very violently. Um, and this leads to uh, these features called calderas. Um, and so a uh, the basically size and elevation change lost um, during the formation of a caldera. So from a a uh, highly catastrophic eruption um, is directly linked to the size of the magma chamber beneath the volcano and how catastrophic the eruption is. So um, basically the percent change in elevation lost gives us information about the size of the magma chamber below the volcano and how catastrophic um, that eruption was. So in your quiz, you're going to be asked to compare Mount St. Helens and Krakatoa um, and their elevation changes due to um, an eruption for each of the volcanoes. And what that and what that tells you about, um, you know, the, the scales of these volcanic eruptions. Uh, so just to give you an example of how to calculate elevation change, um, I'm going to step you through um, Krakatoa. So here's a picture of Krakatoa with the uh, old summit pre-eruption um, outlined. And um, so to calculate the percent change in elevation, um, we take the initial elevation or we subtract the final elevation from the initial elevation and divide that by the initial elevation. So that gives us the fractional change. Um, in elevation, and then we'll multiply that by 100 to get it into a percent. So some values for Krakatoa in 2018, the initial pre-eruption um, elevation was approximately 3,600 feet, and the final elevation after the eruption was approximately 2,667 feet. So the percent change in elevation um, is 100 times, again, initial minus final divided by initial, where now um, we can substitute in the initial, so that's 3,600 feet, um, and then the final, which is 2,667 feet. Um, and then plugging in these numbers into a calculator gives a 26% elevation change. Um, so this was a pretty, pretty catastrophic eruption. Um, 26% of the initial height was basically blasted away um, in this in this eruption. Um, so that's uh, that's all I have for this lecture. Um, if you have questions, please contact your virtual TA for this lab. Um, there's also a few supplemental videos that give you a little bit uh, more detail on some of the topics discussed in this lecture. Um, they're all very short, so I highly encourage you to watch those before starting um, before starting the quiz. Um, and thank you.